Good evening, everybody. And congratulations, Dublin. Congratulations because for the fourth year running, it's not the most expensive city in Europe anymore. <laughs> but I just uh, went to uh, O'Brien's because the coffee shop sh uh, was shut to buy myself and uh, Nev uh, a cup of coffee and I paid six euros for this uh, two cups of latte. So I don't know whether or not you're going to make it next year. <laughs> Everything is possible. So, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm a mongrel. I have an Irish mother, a South African father. I grew up in London. I live in Vienna. I'm married to a Bulgarian. I actually don't know who I am, to, uh, to be honest. I don't have a formal education, but I can smell what works. Honest. Uh, since I was 13, I sold fruit and vegetables in, in Covent Garden, and somehow I just get more right than wrong. I can tell what works. And uh, this is an opportunity to sell more than just a product uh, from this country, it's an opportunity to sell a little bit of uh, culture. Because, have a guess how many Irish passports of living people there are in the world. There are 4.2 million people, I think, live here in the Republic. How many do you think living people have an Irish passport? Hello? <laughs> 60 million? Anybody else want to have a go at that? That's pretty brave. 25? There are 73 million people in the world who hold an Irish passport and they are alive. They are alive. Everybody wants to be Irish. Everybody, really. If they, who else is patron saint do you even know? <laughs> really? Uh, and uh, there are parades in Melbourne, there are parades in Sydney, there are parades in New York. Of course, they're all uh, uh, immigrants from, uh, from, from here at one time. Um, this country is famous. It's more famous than for a country of just four million people. And um, of course, culture, arts are, are kind of behind that. And why not food? Because food is tasty here. Really, food is tasty. You just have to sell it better. Okay, let me tell you a little about uh, the discounters um, because uh, that's an interesting story. Why are they actually here? Why did they come to Britain? Um, why not go to somewhere where people don't have any money, like Bulgaria or Czech Republic? Uh, why Ireland? Why Britain? Discounters look for three things in a market that they're going to enter. First of all, they look for a high-wage economy. Now, you're all going to tell me you don't earn enough, so it's not a high-wage economy here, but I promise you, on a global scale, this is a high-wage economy. You have to pay six euros to get two cups of coffee. It must be a high-wage economy. <laughs> it looks uh, for where the uh, industry earns big, fat profits. Big, fat profits. 10% EBITDA, and the discounter starts to get excited. Because when a retailer earns big, fat profits, so do the producers, so do the suppliers, and so does the property uh, industry. Everybody kind of cashes in on it a little, little bit. And uh, it looks uh, for where the property ownership is, uh, is a surety. In other words, if you invest in property, uh, some smart lawyer somewhere produces a bit of paper that says, as long as you've got this bit of paper, you will always own it. It's not like Russia where Mr. Putin can come along and say, no, nah, I own it. Since tomorrow, I own it. These kind of um, uh, economies um, are not interesting for a, a discounter because it's going to invest serious money. And finally, it looks for a high standard of living. Why is that? Because it wants the customer to say, actually, I don't eat things I don't like. I, only th I, I basically eat things I like, and I'm at any price not prepared to go below that. They're the four elements uh, which have to be ticked before a discounter will be interested in the market. By the way, the high-wage economy is because the discounter knows 
that it can run its business much cheaper for, in terms of numbers of hours, uh, in terms of numbers of people, than its competitors. And if those hours of labour or the weeks of work don't count for anything, because people get paid absolute peanuts like China or India or wherever, um, it doesn't count for a lot. It doesn't make your product uh, cheaper. So, uh, it comes to the, uh, the country and uh, nobody will talk to it. Not the producers, not the suppliers, not the property people. Nobody will do it because it is a party wrecker. It's come to a country that's earning 7 to 10% EBITDA and everybody knows if they've done their homework, these guys, if they get traction, are going to wreck the party. So, they have to come with products from abroad. Uh, they have to beg, borrow and steal um, uh, any kind of service. I mean, it's really, really expensive and difficult for a discounter to break into a market like Ireland or, or, uh, or Britain. But it's determined to do it because it knows there are rich pickings um, uh, along the way. It comes with a very specific format. It can't inherit uh, or inhabit somebody else's stores. Um, it needs everything in the same place. If you've seen uh, an Aldi or a Lidl store, 90% of them are identical. And by the way, those 90% are identical around the world. They've all got yellow floor tiles because um, uh, uh, 750 square meters with those tiles can be cleaned in 22 minutes with a certain machine. Not 23, not 21, 22 minutes. And that's the fastest way that you can clean that uh, floor tile. Lots of things I'm going to tell you today uh, which are all focused on cost and um, uh, efficiency. It builds up its store network one by one knowing that it will build very, very fast its buying power. Have a look at uh, some maths. Tesco sales, I won't take Musgraves, it's just too complicated to, to do with uh, SKUs, but let's take Tesco because it's, uh, it's pretty easy to, uh, to understand. Tesco sales in Ireland were 3 billion uh, euros and they got 38,000 SKUs. 81,000 euros per <coughs> SKU per year. Pretty simple set of maths. But we all know that when you're a full-line supermarket, um, actually the Pareto rule um, uh, works. 80% of your sales come from 20% of your range. So let's take 80% of that 3 billion, it's 2.4, and 20% uh, of the range is only 7,600 SKUs. They have 325,000 euros per SKU per year. Now look at Aldi. With half the sales, it's got three times the sale per SKU. Now, imagine that scenario. There's two doors to this supplier's office. On one side stands the... Uh, of a private label supplier. On one side stands the, uh, the Tesco guy, um, and he's offering maybe 325,000. Uh, and on the other side stands the Aldi guy. Today, the Aldi guy gets in first. Because he offers more cash per SKU for a private label supplier than, uh, than anybody else. And it doesn't need uh, uh, market dominance to, uh, to be able to do it. In fact, in the UK, where Tesco had 30% market share uh, with 40,000 SKUs, uh, in 2008, Aldi passed uh, Tesco in terms of buying power for... Uh, uh, for private label SKU. And then the problems start for the industry. Because once you're the biggest buyer, you can largely get what you want. And what I mean by what you want is if you have 1,000 SKUs, which is a discounter's kind of mantra, uh, you, want to co you want to focus on 80% of the market. What you have to do is you have to try to get the most popular quality in every one of your SKUs possible. So when the, all the organisations started in Ireland, it knew right from day one what that product range would be and what the benchmark was. <coughs> it's, it's pretty obvious. It, in tomato ketchup, it's chef. You've got to have that 
taste profile. You've got to have that size of the 300 uh, mil uh, squeezy bottle um, uh, format. Uh, and it's got to taste and perform exactly like Chef. When you first come, you can't do it. You bring Heinz from the UK, uh, or a copy of Heinz from the UK. You bring something from Germany called, uh, that's close to a product called Felix. Um, uh, and uh, a lot of consumers reject it uh, at the beginning because it isn't exactly what they want. Once you have this buying power, you can largely, I won't say completely, but you can largely do what you want. Today in Ireland, uh, all you've got real um, uh, buying power. Uh, they exceed all other players uh, in the market uh, in terms of sales per SKU. And uh, there are many who do business with those discounters uh, in, in the room today. Um, I think it's pretty good business in terms of uh, getting paid and, uh, 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 and there's a certain relationship and loyalty uh, uh, there. Um, but for those who are on the competing end of that, um, the bad news is there's more pressure to come because both companies have 170 pins in the map. Uh, another feature of uh, uh, attacking a market like uh, uh, Ireland is that um, there is a master map uh, done right before the, uh, the market entry is, uh, uh, is started. Uh, there's pins in the map of where the stores are going to be um, so that you don't end up buying one in the wrong place and then you can't put the two or three other uh, options around it uh, uh, correctly. So there will be 340 of these uh, uh, discount stores and if uh, you calculate at the moment the, the market share is about 18%, it's going to reach 25. It's a kind of racing certainty. But it's not all bad news. It's disruption. It's changing the margin uh, expectation for the entire his, uh, industry. Um, but it's not all bad news because once, uh, once those um, 350 stores are, are here, uh, they start to turn their attention on one another. And they need uh, reasons why you would visit one discounter, not the other. And often, Brands, especially famous brands, uh, become those uh, reasons. Because there are some products where the discounter cannot get exactly the quality product that uh, it wants. I have um, a very interesting story to tell you about uh, um, Kit Kat and Nestle a little bit later. Um, but uh, uh, the private label industry is not able to do everything that the branded industry uh, uh, can do. Uh, let's have a look at uh, uh, the players in the market uh, here. You heard a little bit from, uh, from Helen earlier. Dunn's 51% um, uh, private label with 7% of the um, market share on, on food. Uh, but already smaller than Lidl um, with 10.2% uh, uh, share. This adds up to, uh, to 20. Someone else mentioned 18 earlier. Um, I guess it depends whose uh, information you take. This was from Planet Retail. Um, uh, the guys um, with uh, Mace and Spa uh, have got uh, just a bit more than Lidl at 10.74, but only 23% of their business uh, is done in private label, heavily weighted towards the convenience sector. Um, so a lot of uh, um, uh, famous brands uh, in those stores. Aldi, 91% private label and 10.79% uh, share of the market. Tesco, 46 but 22% of the whole market, and of course, um, Super Value plus Co with 31%. Um, uh, and again, with a big convenience business, so uh, the private label uh, uh, percentage is, uh, is lower. So quite a mixed bunch there, from 91 at the top uh, down to 23 uh, in the convenience sector. And you already heard a little bit uh, about um, uh, the different penetrations of, uh, of, of the brands. Um, and it, to be honest, uh, it's really explainable when you start to think about uh, category by category. Um, 
for those of you who uh, produce uh, beers and spirits, uh, for a long time now, you've lived with very low profit margins. Low for everybody, for the retailer. The only person who really gets money out of beers and spirits is the government, uh, uh, with their uh, 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 huge duties that they uh, charge. Um, and uh, because those industries have a low profit margin, there is just not the lust to invest in private label uh, factories and, and facilities. Uh, there's not the interest from the, from the retailers to uh, develop their private labels in, in this area because there's just not enough money to uh, justify it. Personal care, it's a little bit different. Uh, for the men in the audience, if you've ever asked your wife uh, what does she pay for a hair colouring or um, her uh, uh, shampoo, uh, I'm almost sure that you got the response, mind your own business. It's nothing to do with you and it's nothing to do with how much money uh, we're spending. We can afford it, I'm worth it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, uh, we'll feed the kids private label porridge oats, uh, but I'm not compromising on, uh, uh, on any kind of beauty product. That's just how the world works. So, very difficult for a retailer to break into that category um, with product. Uh, also, it's quite difficult in cleaning, because uh, you're going to invest some money um, uh, anyway in these cleaning products and you really want to be sure that it works uh, and the branded products have a superior performance over uh, cheap stuff that you've, part, you've um, uh, bought in the past. I'll tell you an interesting story which just shows you how smart the consumer is. Um, when Aldi wants to enter into a new country and it's not 100% sure, it sends the executive who's supposed to make the recommendation and, uh, and, and do uh, the spade work, it sends them to live for uh, 10 days with a typical family in that country. So I got to go and live in the Czech Republic uh, with a, just a typical, normal uh, family. Uh, the husband was a, was a, um, a train driver. Uh, the wife was a teacher. Um, uh, the average uh, salary in uh, the Czech Republic is about 800 euros um, uh, a person uh, and the costs are as high as here if you live in Prague. So it ain't an e easy life. Um, and uh, you know what I found this uh, very smart lady who was a teacher doing? She bought the best washing powder on the market. She bought uh, a purcell and she washed her husband's shirts and her best clothes in person. And for the bed sheets, for the kids' clothes or whatever, she bought a cheap private label one and uh, she washed uh, other products in that. I mean, how smart is that? When you really think about that, she was prepared uh, to, to buy two uh, products and just do different jobs uh, with them because she didn't trust these expensive uh, uh, shirts uh, because he had to buy his own shirts to, uh, to sit on this uh, branded train line um, and, um, uh, and, and be a train driver and um, uh, she was making sure that they didn't get uh, in any way compromised. That just kind of proved to me how smart the consumer is. Pet food, really difficult category for private label uh, operators. Why? Because you can't taste it. You don't know what it's doing. Is his hair going to fall out? Is the cat going to be happy? Better not chance it. Give the kids the porridge oats. We'll see, they'll tell you if they're yuck. Uh, but the cat, no, 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 the cat gets whiskers. <laughs> Cooked meat, paper, it becomes a little bit easier. Uh, dairy, uh, well, there was an interesting slide from Helen earlier about uh, milk that tastes nice. Can you taste the tea, uh, the milk in your tea? Can you, bugger? Can you taste the tea in your porridge? Can you, bugger? If you're going to drink milk, I understand it. So uh, I can see why for different missions people will buy a cheaper product um, because it just gets uh, used a little bit differently. And the real target of the private uh, uh, label business, the dry and tin packaged grocery business. If you can copy something, if you can really produce something reasonably easily, then uh, private label is going to be camping on your front lawn. So how should these 
brands fight back against uh, all of this market disruption that uh, Aldi and Lidl and the reaction to Aldi and Lidl, uh, how should they fight back? Because uh, what typically happens, and uh, Ireland is really no different to Austria, Germany, Switzerland, Australia, UK, it, it, everything is behaving in the same way, so I can kind of predict, uh, I think, uh, what's going to happen next. Um, is uh, that uh, the discounters come along, grab a chunk of market share at a much lower price than the rest of the industry. The supermarkets respond largely with private label um, um, uh, product, uh, which also uh, means that the whole market is pressurized. Um, uh, there is a certain equilibrium achieved after the discounters have finished with their uh, e expansion. Um, and then uh, brands start to become more important again because they can become the differentiator between uh, the, uh, the businesses. So, to be one of those differentiators, uh, you heard a little bit the story uh, um, uh, in the previous presentation. Your product needs to be unique. It needs to have difficult to copy selling points. If it doesn't, if it's easy to copy, you're in trouble. You better think about another strategy. You can use provenance and history. If you have the oldest uh, tradition uh, um, uh, in a particular product, uh, then there's really a, a chance that uh, your product has an, a more emotional uh, attachment to the consumer. You need new products. Aldi, for example, has, uh, I told you, 1,000 SKUs. It actually has 1,700 products, but it mixes them in the case. So you can find three flavor variants in one case, and it calls it one uh, SKU. So there's actually 1,700 products in these 1,000 uh, SKUs, um, uh, but they're just flavor variants uh, of, of the same item. And they will change out of that 1,000, 110 items every year. That's actually a big percentage. There's always something new to find in an Aldi store. One of the reasons they do it is there isn't much excitement around the price. That stays the same all the time. They just keep uh, one in, one out um, uh, program of uh, uh, new product development. So uh, the brand has got to do the same. Every time you launch a product, think about it, it's already out of date. I need the next one. You've got to tell a story. Marketing is really, really important uh, for brands. If you want to stand out, you've got to shout about it. You can sell the, the, your product to the discounters and, and bargain stores, that, that really works and uh, the time for really thinking about that is now because uh, by the time they mature, and it's only going to take them another two or three years to do that, um, they actually want uh, some kind of differentiator. You've got to be th there and ready with your product. You really can sell a bit of Ireland to the world and you can sell your product to the discounters. I want to tell you about three brands I'm personally a bit of a fan of. Uh, the first one is these guys. I'm a bit of a chocoholic. Uh, I eat a little piece of chocolate every day. Uh, and these guys sell products inside that box that I haven't found anywhere else. They really are exceptional. I think there's the reason why this outfit uh, manages to, to survive uh, really well in uh, otherwise what is a very competitive industry. It's got its own tourist attraction, so you can, um, you can really get quite excited about uh, 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 this brand. Uh, and you find it in 60 airports and 40 different countries of, uh, of, of the world. That's actually where I discovered it. I used to come here every month. Uh, I spent uh, Monday to Friday here and I was expected by the family to bring something home. Uh, and uh, I discovered this problem product and in the end I had to bring bigger suitcase because all the family wanted uh, a pack of this, a pack of that. I mean in the end it became a bit of a nightmare so thank you Butlers. Uh, I really 
like this product. I really like it. I mean, I like it a bit too much, to be honest. Uh, but what, what is really so special about this is every year there is a new product. Now, it says 18 years old on here, so somebody must have thought about that 18 years ago. Maybe it doesn't quite work like that. But the truth is, uh, these guys are really good at um, making you feel good about buying your product. They target 25 to 45, I'd like to think, I'm not, I'm not. Uh, 25 to 45 ambitious social males. And I can even picture this guy. He's got a square chin. He's got a square forehead. His hair looks just fantastic. I mean, it's Brian O'Driscoll. I just know it is. <laughs> but that's how they make you think uh, that you're more like Brian O'Driscoll if you order one of these somewhere in your uh, uh, drinking sensibly, uh, of course. They spend 80 million a year, 80 million euros peddling this story. Respect. Really, respect. That brand is supposed to be worth, uh, if you read in these marketing newspapers, uh, 1.7 billion. That's cool. But it's not all about the big boys. I also am a big fan of this kind of idea. Have you ever tried this product? Yes. It is top notch. I mean, it really is super. It's a crisp. It's an outrageous price. I didn't get change of five euros buying these two packs uh, this afternoon. But it's worth it because it is just a really, really nice experience. And what is it? That's a bit of Ireland. It's potato. I don't know how many sons there are, but I've seen some kind of advert. There must be 20 of the damn guys, uh, all lined up on the, on, the, on, the, on the farm gate, all somehow involved. They all look good. Uh, uh, I'm sure if there was a program, uh, How to Marry a Farmer, these guys would, would have a hundred uh, candidates. Uh, really, respect to uh, these guys. In an area where you can copy the, uh, the category, but they stand out. You don't have to be big. Everybody's got to start somewhere. You just have to have a great idea, and you have to uh, stick to uh, the concept uh, and drive it through. I'd like to tell you a little bit about how, how a retailer thinks. Because um, I was constantly surprised by reactions from my, um, uh, my buying teams about how badly prepared suppliers were for interactions. And I hear it uh, across all kinds of, uh, uh, of industries where the supplier does not really understand the retailer, or worse, the supplier doesn't actually understand the customer. First of all, let's just deal with the retailer. The retailer, by the way, is your route to market. It doesn't matter who you are or what you are, the retailer is just simply the way in which you get the product uh, to the customer. And it's good to understand that not all retailers are the same. If you're uh, working for Tesco or Super Value or Spa and, and Mace, of course they have their own little cultures, but in principle, they will think about, how can I sell more? I'll get promoted if I sell more. I'll get a bigger bonus if I sell more. Um, people will pat me on the back. I'll get recognized if I sell more. And uh, they uh, adopt modern marketing methods, which means that they really think about the consumer's needs and they try to have an option for every consumer's need possible. That's where it all starts. It starts with a, some kind of uh, fancy marketing tree. But in the end, it's there is a need, and I have to get a product available for the customer to meet that need. A discounter is a completely different animal. You know what a discounter thinks about? Thinks about costs. Thinks about how can I organize things cheaper, at, uh, with lower um, uh, costs, with less hours. Uh, uh, it, it celebrates ideas 
which take cost out of the business. I'll tell you a great story, which I just know that uh, somebody in Tesco or Super Value uh, would, would never stand up and, and, and talk about. There was a store manager in, um, uh, in the UK who invented a new concept. He worked out, and he measured it, that his staff, who were pretty normal human beings, went to the toilet 1.8 times per day during the working shift. And he thought, i tell you what we're going to do. John, when you go to the loo, you go down that aisle and take all the empty cardboard boxes uh, with you, and I'm putting the, from tomorrow, the cardboard compactor right next to the toilets. Jane, you go down that aisle, and John, you go down that aisle. You would not believe over 9,000 stores, over 365 days a year, how much money that saved. Because that was previously an operation that had to be done, and now it was being done for kind of free. That's what the discounter thinks about. It thinks about how it can shave a few seconds off the uh, functions of every store. Did you ever pick up a discounter package, private label? It's got a barcode twice the size with only eight lines on it, and it's on every selling face of the packet so that the cashier doesn't turn it over to scan it, because that costs some seconds to try to find the barcode. She just whizzes it across. I mean, you can't believe the detail that uh, these guys will go into to try to reduce the costs of, uh, uh, of running the business. When they reduce the costs, they are able to bring the price down, and the price gap that they open up is what drives the sales. When a discounter has 20% price differential, it's like pouring petrol on its uh, sales. It's like rocket fuel. When the price gap is closed to, to 12%, the sales uh, stop altogether uh, defecting from uh, elsewhere. Because what a discounter can't offer is choice. It has one version of everything. It has one ketchup, one mayonnaise, um, one of every customer's needs, it, it has no duplication whatsoever. And for some customers, you already heard uh, um, uh, a little bit about the facts, for actually four-fifths of customers, that choice um, is only uh, palatable, uh, or lack of choice is only palatable if the price differential is, uh, uh, is great enough. So a discounter, what it really needs from, uh, 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 from uh, its suppliers is knowledge. You are expected to understand the customer. You are expected to present the case to say, here is a customer need, and if you buy my product, you will uh, fulfill it. Of course, you have to understand that the discounter will want the product presented in a certain way with a certain kind of tray so that their business is uh, very simple to, uh, uh, to manage. But uh, you are expected to, uh, to understand the consumer and bring the idea. And they're willing to change more than 10% of their range uh, every year. So there's not a, pos there's not a problem with uh, um, uh, getting in there. You've just got to have the business case uh, for your product. By the way, that's the same for uh, any retailer. You have to be an expert in your category. These guys uh, generally um, these days are covering several categories. They cannot be as good a knowledge base as you have. Um, uh, and so you can fill the void and um, uh, present your case. You should research constantly to find the new gaps. And never rest. Keep upgrading products. Quick story about Weetabix. Weetabix is an incredibly simple product to make. Really, honestly, we, 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 we could figure it out in an hour and all do it ourselves uh, now. So what these guys did, because they have a very good business, is they said, you know what, private label's going to kill us if we're not careful. We'll buy it all. We'll go around and we'll buy all the big factories. Uh, then we'll own it, and we'll upgrade the private label um, uh, Weetabix so it's the same product that w we make. And the, uh, the really clever piece is we'll invent a new product every six months, 
and we'll say to the discounter, you can have that in private label, but not straight away. We'll do the brand, we'll get the uh, benefit from that, and eventually I'll turn it into private label uh, for you to prevent you going elsewhere uh, because you get an inferior product. Um, very successful long-term strategy. For a very easily copyable product, Weetabix uh, deliver both their own brand and the um, uh, private label into all the discounters uh, uh, in the UK and um, they have a good profit and a good sales uh, position. <coughs> I was asked some questions by Nif um, uh, about um, partner adversary uh, uh, from the retail standpoint. Um, uh, and I'd like to tell you a little story about Nestle. Um, it's uh, a very interesting story because I tell you what we couldn't do in an hour. We couldn't figure out how to make Kit Kat. Kit Kat is an incredibly difficult product. That wafer, that chocolate, not matting them uh, run into one another, it's really, really complex. I tried, I promise you, for 10 years I tried to get a private uh, label Kit Kat and I could never do it. So, the um, uh, same for my colleagues in, in Germany and in the end they had such a, a difficulty they managed to list uh, Kit Kat in Germany um, and uh, I thought, okay, I'll give up, I'll, I'll call the, the branded guy um, and uh, tell him, I can't make the product as well as yours, uh, please deliver me your uh, product. He wouldn't answer my calls. For five years he wouldn't answer my calls. Five years. So then, I should have thought of it uh, earlier, I had the bright idea to tell the German business, order 20 more trucks and just send them to me. So I, they had English on the pack. Um, Kit Kat is the same in Germany. Um, it, it, it's a little bit more uh, uh, German language on pack, but it, the English was there, so it was legal. And in I bought Kit Kat and started selling it. Well, the complaints started. The complaints started because chocolate in Germany has a hazelnut taste. And Kit Kat are smart enough to reflect that, so it's a completely different recipe. So customers bought it in my stores and then wrote back to Nestle to say, Bleh, the product's not right, it tastes funny, it's off. Uh, and they suddenly had a massive rise in uh, complaints. And then we had uh, the um, MD of, uh, of, of Nestle UK uh, phoning me up. And after hearing for five years previously uh, that he wouldn't answer my calls uh, uh, and that he'd never heard of this company, uh, Aldi UK, I said, Nestle? Nestle? Never heard of you. <laughs> I put the phone down. Uh, it's a bit of a party piece, uh, um, but the, the reality is, you see, that was done from both sides. One of the things that I would uh, criticise the retail and supplier relationship um, uh, for is not getting together at the senior levels more often. Just to talk about each other's uh, issues and uh, goals uh, to try to align those uh, possibilities. Of course there is some adversarial uh, scenarios there but uh, getting together and talking about it makes you understand a little bit better uh, the partnership necessary to make the whole thing work. Uh, do retailers care about long-term supplier relationships? You bet they do. Really, they do. Especially if you have a product their customers want. Never forget that. <laughs> the retailer uh, needs your products. Um, and uh, there's some very good examples uh, here. Haribo uh, is a very successful um, uh, candy product. Uh, the, the Aldi and Lidl organisation don't do a private label simply because it's very convenient to do business with uh, the Haribo guys. Do retailers think about trademark and intellectual property? Not really. They'll copy it to uh, whatever's legal. That's just life. And what's the most single and most important thing that a brand operator can do to be successful? Have personality. Be unique. Be difficult to copy. Thanks very much. <laughs>